Hey everybody, Sung here. This video is going to be a quick one. Today, we're going to learn how to wax your snowboard. We're going to cover why you should wax your board, what you need, and how to do it. No lengthy intro this time, so let's get right into it. Now, why should you wax your board? Simply put, wax does two things. One, it protects the base from minor damage or abrasion, and two, it makes you go faster. Wax is your board's oxygen and life force. Not only does it protect the base from small scratches, but it keeps you moving faster at your runs. If you want to make sure that your favorite board stays fast and stays with you for a while, get the materials I'll mention in a second and follow along as I wax my own board. Here are the materials you'll need. First of all, you'll need your board, obviously, and a screwdriver. Next, you'll need all temperature snowboard wax, any brand works. You'll also need a snowboard waxing iron, which is different from your typical clothes iron. Snowboard wax irons don't have holes in them and are specifically made for snowboard waxing. And last but not least, a plastic wax scraper. This one is optional. A vise, which is a screw-on apparatus that gives you a platform to put the board on. Alright, now that you have everything, let's get started. First, find a stable surface to place the board on. Then place your board on the surface or the vise. Turn your iron on and adjust the temperature to the temperature range recommended on the wax you're using. It's usually on the packaging or in the information area of the website you bought it off of. And while you wait for the iron to heat up, take off the bindings off your board so they don't interfere with the waxing process. When the waxing iron is fully heated, bindings off, and base facing upwards, it's time to put some wax on your board. Most people will put wax on their board by dripping it on their board which is done by holding the bar of wax flush to the hot iron to melt and drip the wax onto the board. Then, they smear the drips of wax on the board, spreading it out over the board. Don't do this, and if you currently do this, never do it again. Dripping is messy and wastes a lot of unneeded wax. Instead, crayon on the wax like this. Hold the wax bar against the iron for a second, then pass the melted part of the wax bar on the board. The hot part of the wax bar will crayon onto the base. Do this section by section until your whole board looks like it's been very neatly graffitied on with wax, like you can see here. Once you've crayoned the whole base, remelt the wax into the board by getting your iron, placing it on the board, and making long lengthwise passes, tip to tail. Make sure to go slow, moving the iron about half an inch to an inch per second. The melt trail, which is the trail of still melted wax that's currently cooling down behind the iron, should be about 46 inches. Complete this process over the whole board. Crayoning is better than dripping because it uses less wax and is a lot less messier. Any wax that isn't absorbed into the board when it's getting heated up is actually wasted, so we want to use just enough to cover the base. This makes our bar of wax last a lot longer because we use less wax in general, and the whole waxing process becomes a lot cleaner than dripping. I mean, without dripping, there's no pushing melted wax around the hot base or having to scrape off dried wax off the floor all the time. If you really don't think that the amount of wax used when crayoning is enough, just crayon on another layer of wax and melt that layer too. After you're done applying the wax, wait several hours for the heated wax and board to cool. While the board cools, the wax will be infused into the base further. Only waiting until the board reaches room temperature isn't enough. Just wait overnight or at least 6 hours for everything to cool completely. Once the board is fully cooled, grab a plastic scraper and get scraping. Scrape tip to tail in sections. Tilt the scraper against the board at an acute angle and push oblique to it. Doing it the other way can damage the base through scratching over time. Don't dig the corner of the scraper into the board either to prevent making long scratches in your base. To make the job way easier, use a sharp plastic scraper, like this Dekine plastic one. Make sure you scrape every last mound of wax on your board. Any wax that remains on top of your base is going to slow you down. And that's it! Once you've scraped all the cooled extra wax off your board, your board is ready to ride. That's it for this video, and thanks for watching! Just kidding. Everything up to this point can be found on literally every other snowboard waxing video on the internet, but this isn't your typical waxing video. Let's get into what you really came for. First, I'll explain the true mechanics of snowboard wax, how wax is actually absorbed and functions in your snowboard to give you speed. Next up, I'll talk about how to wax your board more efficiently in as little as 15 minutes. No, I'm not kidding, just 15 minutes. No messy wax dripping or even crayoning, and no scraping. 
Finally, I'll go over brushing and structuring, another aspect of taking care of a snowboard that 99% of riders don't know about, but should know to keep their boards running faster and lasting longer than ever before. Alright, let's go over how snowboard wax really works. Almost all snowboard bases are made of a variant of a material called polyethylene, or PTEX for short. Skis and snowboards use UHMWPE, which is short for Ultra High Molecular Weight Polyethylene, but no need to worry about that, everyone just calls it PTEX. PTEX is in the similar vein of material as Teflon, which is the stuff that some of your frying pans may be made out of, in the sense that both are very slippery. However, PTEX is more durable and microscopically porous, or has more microscopic holes in its structure. It might be more accurate to say microscopic tears and scratches than holes, but for simplicity, we'll refer to those micro tears and scratches as pores. But PTEX isn't indestructible, and the base of any snowboard will wear out over time. Remember, the snow we're sliding on isn't just frozen water, it's ice crystals, microscopically sharp crystals, and when riding over these tiny sharp crystals with our boards, the crystals rub against the base like extremely fine grit sandpaper. Man-made snow has a sharper crystal structure than natural snow, so for someone like me who rides indoors all the time, this is terrifying. Now, what does this mean for your board? As you ride with an unwaxed base, the snow rubs and scrapes against the raw base and wears it down. You go slower, and your PTEX base wears down, and you go even slower, and your base wears down further, etc. This wearing down process is called abrasion, and it results in a few things. First, you'll notice that you're going slower on your board every day, and eventually, it'll feel like your board is sticking to the snow. If you look at your board, grayish streaks will appear on the base due to continued abrasion, especially close to the edges. And in the end, your board becomes completely unusable and you can't get down the hill at all. Which brings us to why we use wax. Wax has two primary functions. The first is to protect the PTEX base. When wax is infused into the base, it protects against small abrasions, mainly the snow crystals rubbing against the base like I mentioned before but also tiny pieces of dirt and rocks skimming across the base as you ride. Things that are impossible to see, but are happening every time you go down a slope. The second is to make the board faster. The general snowboard community understands that waxing your board makes it faster, but doesn't really understand how wax actually works to gain speed. And it's not like you need to know, but this nerdy stuff is what this video is for, so pay close attention. When you heat up the base of a board with an iron, the PTEX expands slightly, and so do its microscopic pores. Remember, we say pores, but these pores are actually micro tears, scratches, and grooves that we can't see with our naked eye. When you heat up the base of a board with an iron and also have wax, the heated wax seeps into the expanded pores, and now wax is effectively infused into your base. The board has to cool, and when it does eventually, the PTEX in its pores shrink, trapping the cooled and infused wax further into its base. Now let's talk about when you actually ride. Remember, snow and man-made snow is microscopically abrasive, like very fine grit sandpaper. When a waxed board slides on the snow, the infused wax actually melts the top snow in contact with the base due to having a higher friction coefficient than the pretex. This creates a very, very thin layer of water under the board. The base is slippery and hydrophobic also thanks to the wax, so due to gravity, the base of the board and the rider pass right over the water layer. As the board passes over the water layer, the snow refreezes behind immediately. This process uses a small amount of wax constantly, so eventually your base will run out of wax, which means after a few days it's time to re-wax. Now you might be asking, why not just use a lot of wax all the time? The reason we don't use excessive wax is because wax has a higher friction coefficient than PTEX. If you have too much of it on your base, it'll actually slow you down. In fact, any wax that isn't infused into the porous PTEX base and is just sitting on top of the base is a complete waste and needs to be removed through scraping, which is why scraping is so important for the classic wax method. Riding with an unscraped base is slow, but the worst part is, is that your board's base actually gets damaged due to chunks of base material being ripped out with the wax that sticks to the snow as you ride over it. Now, notice I said the classic method of waxing, where you apply wax, wait for it to cool, and scrape. This method is tried and true, but it takes a really long time and not to mention how messy everything is, especially with the scraping. Now, you could wax your board that way, which takes several hours and a lot of elbow grease. Or you could do it the alternative way with a paper towel. Not what you expected, right? This waxing method is a bit of an unknown, but
but I've decided to share it to the world for the sake of easier waxing for everyone. Compared to the conventional wax and scrape method, this paper towel method is quicker, uses much less wax, and doesn't require scraping or waiting several hours. And the only extra thing you need is a paper towel. Along with the normal waxing tools, of course. So that would include your board, a waxing iron, some wax, and the paper towel itself. Let's actually learn how to do the paper towel method. First, turn on the iron to the proper wax temperature, which is indicated on the packaging or online. While the iron heats up, crayon your wax onto the base without melting it. Because the wax is unmelted, you will have to apply more pressure to the bar as you crayon the wax onto the base. However, only crayon a very thin layer of wax. That's all you need. Now, use your heated iron to melt the crayon wax into a very thin surface layer of wax on your base. Next, get a normal quality brand name paper towel and wet it with cold water completely. Squeeze the paper towel slightly so some water comes out, but so that the paper towel still has a good amount of water in it. Now here's the important part. Take the paper towel and press it against the board with the iron. While pressing the paper towel with the iron onto the board, move the iron tip to tail along with the paper towel. The heated board is now being quickly infused with a thin layer of wax. You will have to go in sections, but one pass for the total length of the board is enough. And that's it! Can't believe how easy this method is? Neither could I. Ever since my friends introduced me to this method, I've never had to wait hours for wax to cool or clean up scraped wax shavings for any routine wax job. This method isn't foolproof though, there are certain caveats to this method, like everything else. This method isn't as 100% effective as hot waxing, maybe 90%, but it saves a lot more time compared to the traditional wax and scrape method. The slim minority of snowboarders that value speed above all else, such as snowboard cross racers and technical riders, might disapprove of this method because it isn't as effective as a true hot wax and scrape, but for the recreational rider this method is quick and produces good enough results for a normal week of riding. After running over the whole surface area of the board once with the iron and paper towel, that's it. You're done. Just a side note, don't use low quality wax with this method as it'll melt and dribble too quickly. Higher quality wax is paste-like and crayon-like, which is essential for this method, and using better wax will allow you to go faster and have a better riding experience in general. I can personally attest to the difference between how different quality wax feels. Lower quality wax makes you feel like you're riding on sandpaper, while higher quality wax makes you feel like you're actually gliding on the snow. I use Zoom Wax, much more expensive than lower quality stock wax like Demon Wax. But remember, with this new paper towel method, you're only using 2-3 to three grams out of a whole 140 gram $40 bar every time you wax, as compared to the large amount of lower grade wax you might use with the more time consuming wax and scrape method. You can do the math. Now before you go start ordering bars of high quality wax online, there's another aspect of wax you have to consider. The wax is temperature grading. There are different waxes for various outdoor temperature ranges, all which need to be used in the proper setting to ensure you don't lose any speed. There are three primary temperature ranges, cold, warm, and all temperature. The first type, cold wax, is for use in cold temperatures where cold, dry, and microscopically ice-crystalled abrasive snow is the primary type of snow encountered. Cold waxes are harder, make your base harder, and provide more abrasion resistance. For those riding in man-made snow primarily, such as some warmer resorts or indoor resorts like big snow, man-made snow is microscopically more abrasive than natural snow, meaning that you want to go with the cold wax in these situations. The next type of wax is warm wax. For use in warm temperatures, where warmer, wetter snow that causes suction through surface tension rains. This type of wax is hydrophobic and repels water pretty well, meaning that the melted snow and water will wick off the base quickly and not stick to your board. Warning though, warm wax has less abrasion resistance and is softer, so use it only in areas when you need to. And then there's all temperature wax. All temperature wax is for if you don't want to spend brain cells or money deciding whether you want to buy a hot or cold wax. Each temperature wax has its own wax iron temperature that the iron should be set to when using for waxing jobs. Colder temperature waxes have to have higher iron temperatures because they're harder. This temperature can usually be found on the packaging of the wax or on the product page online. Make sure to use the right temperatures for the right type of wax. Alright, that was all the main stuff relevant to waxing. 
Up next is some extra tips and info you'll need to keep in mind when you do any kind of waxing job. Before you wax your board, do all of your edge tuning first. I'll be making an edge tuning video soon, so make sure to stay tuned for that if you're not sure how to tune your edges. Also, make sure to wax your board every 4-5 to five days to make sure that abrasion doesn't occur and you stay fast throughout the week. Here's a lifesaver tip. Invest in a good waxing iron. The difference between an economy waxing iron and a world cup iron is staggering, and ever since I bought the bigger one I've never gone back. You don't have to buy a world cup snowboard waxing iron, but here are a few advantages of buying a higher quality iron at least over your $30 one on Amazon. Higher quality irons retain desired temperatures far far better than cheap irons. When a fully heated waxing iron makes physical contact with a room temperature board with unmelted wax on its face, the heat of the iron transfers to the wax in the board due to thermodynamics. This means as the board and wax's temperatures goes up, the temperature of the iron actually goes down, and it goes down by quite a lot. So for all irons regardless of quality, even if you put the waxing iron to 120 degrees celsius, as soon as you press it onto the wax applied board, the temperature of the iron dips down like crazy. And this is where the greatest difference between the low and high quality wax and irons are. Lower quality irons will do their best to reheat themselves to the set temperature you wanted when you press them onto the board, but it often takes a long, long time, long after you've made several passes already on your board's base. Meaning you've heated your board and waxed it very unevenly, maybe not even enough to actually heat up the base and open the microbores. Plus, you won't even know how long it'll take for the iron to reheat up eventually to the correct temperature, because the only thing that cheap irons have are a light that goes off when the inputted temperature is finally reached. On the other hand, higher quality waxing irons have the ability to quickly adjust temperatures to match external conditions. For example, as soon as 120 degrees celsius heated world cup iron makes contact with the wax base, it dips down just a few celsius, though it quickly corrects itself very close to the initially set temperature. So I know when I heat the iron and pass it over my board, it stays very close to the temperature I want it to be. And thanks to the digital temperature gauge on the iron, I know exactly how hot the iron is at all times, and the base of my board is very evenly heated when I pass the iron along it, making for an almost perfect waxing experience. Another advantage of having a higher quality iron over a cheaper one is that the higher quality one will have a better metal plate. The metal plate is the part of the iron that touches the base of the snowboard, and on better irons will be larger and heavier, meaning more surface area for less total passes on your board, and a stockier and more secure feel when moving the iron around on your base. The most important aspect of the plate though, is the consistency of the heat distribution around its surface area. For cheaper irons, the temperature will not be completely the same over just the plate itself, which means that different sections of your board get heated up differently in just one pass. A high quality iron will have a more uniform temperature over the whole metal plate, ensuring that your board gets the same temperature over the whole plate for every pass, every time. Now it begs the questions, regardless of the iron, what happens if you keep an iron on one spot for too long on a board's base? When you keep an iron over one spot over too long, the PTEX base directly under the iron will greatly expand compared to the surrounding base, causing bubbling, warping, and discoloration. This is extremely hard to fix and sometimes can completely ruin a board, so don't leave your heated iron on the board in the same place for more than 10 seconds at a time. Now, it takes a while to ruin your board completely, but just to see if you're overheating your base, after passing your iron over the top of your board a few times, touch your top sheet, which is on the bottom. If it feels slightly warm, that's good enough, your board is heated well. If it feels extremely warm or too hot, you're overdoing it and will soon damage your base. If your iron starts smoking when you turn it on, it's because of the remaining wax from the last wax job melting, especially if the iron is at a temperature that the leftover wax isn't meant for. Remember to use the proper respective temperature of the wax you're using. Now, if you see small dimples on the base of your board after waxing multiple times, don't worry. This is called dimpling, where the area of your base where your binding inserts are starts warping slightly. Slight concave dimples are mostly normal, but can be prevented by taking out your bindings when you wax, at least for the most part. Now, whenever I get a new board, I like to do the traditional hot wax apply, weight, and scrape method for at least the first three wax sessions back to back, if possible. What this does is open up the micropores and really load up the base with wax. The more times you wax an individual board, the longer you'll able to go without waxing it again. 
The base will get loaded up with wax naturally over time if you consistently wax your board correctly with either the traditional scrape method or the new paper towel method, but I like to do this to significantly expedite the process. I like to think that a board that has been waxed frequently, even with the lowest quality wax, will always be faster in the long run than a board that has had the best, even World Cup level wax, just once. For off-season storage, use special base prep wax, which is cheaper and specifically made for long-term storage. If you're paranoid that you might be messing up the wax types, just apply a layer of your normal wax, don't scrape it off, and put the board in storage in a dry, room temperature room with no sunlight. When you're ready to use the board again, just scrape off and polish, I'll talk about polishing in a second, the wax and the board's base, and you'll be ready to go. And for those of you who are aware of the existence of cork, overlay, rub-on liquid, spray waxes, fluorocarbons, I have no comment on those as I haven't had much experience with most of those things. Alright, remember back when I said that wax that isn't infused into the cooled base and is resting on the surface will not aid in helping you go faster. In fact, excess wax left on your base will actually make you go slower, too much friction, and will rip out chunks of your base, causing hard to repair damage and heavy speed reduction. And whether you perform the classic wax and scrape method or the paper tower method, there will always, always be a tiny layer of leftover and detrimental wax left on your board's base. So after every wax job, classic or paper towel method, we have to brush and polish our base, which involves using a series of brushes to remove that final, thin, persistent layer of wax, flush out whatever's left in the base of your board, and to really get your base faster than ever. First, let's go over the different types of brushes and what they each do. The most common ones that you might get in a kit and are good for our use are brass or copper or bronze brushes. These are used to pull out old wax along with dirt and other impurities prior to actually waxing. But more importantly, these are also the first brushes used after the wax process is finished. For the sake of not tongue twisting myself, I'm going to refer to brass slash copper slash bronze brushes as soft metal brushes. These brushes aren't soft by any means, but they are the softest metal brushes that are used for snowboard brushing. Next up are nylon brushes, which are brushes that have fine plastic bristles that clean out the structure of the board. Now, what is structure? Some of your boards might have a structure in its base, which is a physical pattern grounded to the base that facilitates the behavior of snow and water wicking off the board, similar to how snow tires on cars have patterns in them. This can only be done with dedicated machines, and only usually done with a base grinder in a shop. The nylon brushes, especially the finer ones, are able to reach deep into the base structure without ruining it, pulling out the deeply embedded wax from the grooves of the structure. This action is called polishing the base or the structure and results in a glistening, shiny, and smooth base. When using nylon brushes, feel free to wet the brush a little before brushing. This actually reduces static buildup and ball up the remaining wax left off the brush making the process a bit easier. And finally, we have horsehair brushes, which further polish the base, pulls out the last bit of remaining wax, and breaks static. When using any hand brush, brush in sections, not completely tip to tail, and go edge to edge. You'll be surprised just how much wax dust you'll find on your brush on your board. All that is extra wax just sitting on top of your base, slowing you down and damaging your board when you ride. As a general rule of thumb, Metal brushes are for removing surface wax, man-made fibers are for cleaning structure and polishing, and natural fibers are for finer polishing. There are other types, but they are more for hardcore racers or Olympians. For recreational use, these three brush types are more than enough. And with brush size, bigger is best. Have both rectangular and oval brushes. The oval ones are better because they have more surface area, so less work per pass. They might cost a little more, but in terms of efficiency, the larger opal brushes win by a long shot. There are also the roto brush versions of the soft metal, nylon, and horsehair brushes. Roto brushes, or rotating brushes, are cylindrical brushes that can be attached to a low profile drill and can be spun around the top of a base to polish or brush it. Compared to any hand brush, the time it takes to complete a brush and polish shop with these things is fast, and not to mention the effectiveness. The power of the drill does a better job structuring the base than any human hand ever could. When using these, make sure not to overdo it and press the roto brush too much at a high RPM into the base. This will cause damage to both your board's base and your brush. 
and always make sure to use roto brushes in properly ventilated areas with personal protective gear. These things kick up a lot of wax dust despite having a shield, and you want to make sure you don't inhale any of that wax dust that gets kicked up by the drill. Alright, now that you know the basics of brushing and structuring after waxing, let's talk about what order you have to perform the brushing in. Now, before you wax your board at all, use a soft metal brush to brush out any old wax and other impurities such as dirt and random chemicals on your base. Make sure to wipe with a paper towel after every section to avoid rebrushing old wax dust. After finishing the initial brushing, perform the wax procedure. Whether you wax with old wax and scrape method or the paper towel method, there will always be a layer of useless wax left on the base of your board, which you will have to brush. Do it in this order. Start with the soft metal brush to immediately remove most of the leftover wax on the base. Brush just like how you did before you waxed. You should see a whole bunch of wax dust coming off the base building up in clumps. Remember to wipe this residue off with the paper towel. The wax dust will also muck up your brush, so feel free to clean your brush by running it under cold water anytime. Next up, use the nylon brush to polish the structure in the board. You can put some water on the brush to assist in reducing static buildup, and of course you should wipe off every section. Finally, use the horsehair brush to remove the last bits of wax and to finalize the structuring and wipe off every section just like the first brush. And that's it! There should be a noticeable difference in how the base feels and looks. An unstructured base right out of a wax job looks kind of opaque and cloudy and doesn't feel too smooth, due to the leftover wax on the surface. A properly structured and brushed base shines under the light and feels extremely smooth to the touch. Now, all this might seem complicated and time consuming, but I think that in terms of speed and taking care of your board long term, brushing is just as equally important as waxing. There are a lot of steps, but this is the definitive way to properly brush and wax your board, at least in terms of basics. Now technically you don't have to do any of this, but if you maintain your base like this after every wax job, and also tune your edges constantly, your board will last you a very long time. Now if you're using roto brushes, the order is still the same. Soft metal, then perform the wax job, then soft metal again, then nylon, then horsehair. I like to hand brush just for the soft metal. There is a roto brush version of this, but these roto brushes are powerful, and if you overdo it with this specific soft metal roto brush, you can really damage your base to the point of no repair. So for soft metal brushing, I always opt to go with elbow grease. The nylon and horsehair roto brushes are vastly more effective than their handheld counterparts and polish the structure a thousand times better as well. There isn't much of a risk of overdoing it and damaging your board as much as with the soft metal roto brush. If you'd like, spray some water on the base of the board when using the nylon and horsehair roto brush. This prevents static buildup and catches a lot of wax dust and prevents it from flying around everywhere. And again, make sure you're wearing the necessary personal protective equipment and have proper ventilation. Nobody wants to breathe in a lifetime's worth of wax dust. Now, after every waxing or brushing session, make sure to clean all of your brushes and other tools. Having old wax buildup in your brushes is the fastest way to force yourself to buy new ones when the neglected ones get too gunked up to use up anymore. And here's a little tip. If you don't have time to do a hot wax but still want your board fast enough for the next day, one good temporary measure is to give the base several passes with a nylon brush. This is going to re-establish the surface structure in your base and make it smoother for several more hours of riding. It'll hold you off from waxing for like a day, but don't get too reliant on this though, give your board the proper treatment it needs to make it last a while. Alright, that's the end of it. That was a lot of info as usual. To finish this video off, here's a list of the tools of everything you need to perform all the waxing and brushing I talked about in this video at least. You can just pause the video if you want to see what tools you'll need. I've included an economy kit for those cash strapped, a higher end kit with more useful gear, and finally the list of tools of what I use. In addition to the list, I'll also provide the Amazon links to all the tools that I used in this video and in the video description. I'm not sponsored by any of these brands. These are just what I think are quality tools that will do a great job if used right. And now that you've watched this video, you can. Thank you so much for watching until the end. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to know when I release a new one. Alright, that's it. See you guys next time.